afternoon. This section of the research agenda covers prevention of illicit drugs and those obtained outside of legitimate sales, that is, abuse of prescription medication. And as with the other sections, we're going to be highlighting what we know and also needed research, this time in four areas of drug policy that fall under prevention, loosely. Uh, first, criminal justice policy. Uh, some of you may know that mandatory, many of you, that mandatory minimum penalties have fueled a huge increase in the criminal justice population during the past 20 years. Marijuana is the most common illegal drug, and states' policies differ greatly. Uh, some enforce mandatory minimums, while other states extend options to suspend incarceration for small and first-time offenders. Um, we do know that excessive incarceration has negative effects. It exacerbates HIV and other STDs and destabilizes communities. Um, we also know that minority communities are at highest risk for these effects. Now the good news, though, is that drug courts have emerged as an alternative to incarceration for nonviolent offenders with substance abuse problems. Reviews of hundreds of studies have shown that drug courts reduce criminal recidivism and enhance exposure to treatment. So given this picture, some of the important research needed still is what are the long-term effects of drug courts on outcomes in addition to criminal recidivism, notably substance use and abuse, employment, and parenting. How do different <coughs> state policies compare in terms of their outcomes? For example, criminal recidivism, illegal drug use by adults and juveniles, employment. And very important, what are the impacts of parental incarceration on children and families? Financial impact, psychological, social. In contrast to the drug court area, we know almost nothing about this area. It's a very important one. 2.5 million children have a parent who is currently incarcerated, an additional 5 million children have a parent who's under parole or probation. The second area we're going to highlight is school-related policies. Now, when we think about drug prevention, this is the area we tend to think about. This may be because most prevention programs are located in schools, and the bulk of research has been, promoted, prom excuse me, has been devoted to developing and testing curricular-based programs in schools. And we do know that a few of these programs are effective, uh, at least some of the time. However, we also know that schools tend to select programs that are of questionable effectiveness, such as DARE, and homegrown programs, and often implement even the evidence-based programs poorly. Now, I'm happy to say that research is already underway, mostly sponsored by NIDA, to test some options to address these issues. By contrast, though, what I want to emphasize is that very little is known about school-based policies for on-campus drug use and sales. For instance, suspension, parental notification, counseling, and alternative schooling. And school districts are spending quite a bit of resources and money on these options. The only school-based policy that has received some attention is drug testing, which is still a very low priority in states and school districts. Between 5 and 9 percent of districts utilize it. And there is little clear evidence that it has positive effects. Shifting to the federal level, the Safe and Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act has provided state-based <coughs> infrastructure for schools since 1988 hopefully so that they can utilize and employ, implement well some of these programs and policies. And starting in 1998, DOE uh, required that, evident, that these um, monies be used for evidence-based programs. Nevertheless, unfortunately, funding and support for safe and drug-free schools has steadily declined in recent years. So some highlights of what we need to know. What is the nature and effectiveness of school policies? for on-campus drug use and sales, uh, besides drug testing. What do we know about drug testing at this point? What are the characteristics of schools like lunchroom monitoring and teacher training and positive discipline that can prevent bullying, violence, and drug-related delinquency? 
Uh, the next level that we have looked at in the documents you have is community level prevention <coughs> policy. I'm going to skip that because Tom has mentioned it and um, Harold just spoke about it also in terms of alcohol. It's not really all that different. Um, the last area that we focused on in terms of drug prevention is uh, prevention of the illegal use of prescription medications. This area of legal drugs has escalated in recent years and has received quite a bit of attention. It's actually a rather complicated area for prevention because, for example, surveys show that by far the largest source of psychotherapeutic drugs for, that young people obtain, about 70% of those that they obtain, are free or stolen from friends and relatives. Not the easiest thing to prevent, but we should certainly look, be looking to do that, to find ways to do that. Only 2% of these drugs were purchased on the internet, although the DEA says that this is a growing problem. Also, I'm happy to say there are several federal initiatives underway, some, that emphasize prevention of um, prescription medications and abuse of those. However, it's not clear to what extent these are effective. So given this picture, a priority topic for research certainly includes how effective is the national youth media campaign in reducing access to prescription medications for young people. Another, is there evidence that advertising prescription drugs directly to consumers has increased the non-medical use of psychoactive and other kinds of medications? Thank you very much. The next presenter is Dennis McCarty on <coughs> alcohol and drug treatment.